Okay, I just finished recording something and I kind of feel like I'm on a roll, so... I want... Uh, uh, wow. So, as I was trying to say, I wanted to uh, record some audio without a script, just to uh, get something done quickly, I guess. And uh, I want to talk about cold iron. So, there's this idea that, you know, fairies and uh, demons and you know, some other kind of magical beings are vulnerable to this material known as cold iron. And so there's kind of a discussion about what exactly that is in the fantasy community. And uh, I put, put quite a lot of time into researching topics related to cold iron, but then eventually I found out something rather disappointing. You see, this idea of cold iron as a distinct material actually comes from Dungeons and Dragons. Like many other bits of fantasy community folklore, it turns out that um, when Wizards of the Coast was creating Dungeons and Dragons, they were looking for, you know, folklore, mythology type stuff that they could butcher. I mean, at the time, it was more of a, a board game than a role-playing game because the role-playing genre hadn't been established yet, but I I should probably have a whole video ranting about how Dungeons and Dragons ruined fantasy, but that's not what this is about either. So they, they found this idea of basically iron being used to repel various kinds of supernatural spirits. This goes back at least to Roman times. They used to feel that the presence of iron would upset dryads because they would use iron axes or steel axes, which were still, you know, it's a type of iron, to cut down trees. And so they would have certain rites that they would perform when they brought iron into a forest, and or at least the, the axes, into a forest and when they took them out. And this later found its way into different cultures in different forms. But for the creators of Dungeons and Dragons, they're like that that didn't really fit with the vision that they had for the game. The way superstition tends to work is it gives you something bad that you need to avoid, and then something that you can do to avoid that bad thing. Like, if you want to keep fairies out of your house, you can just nail a horseshoe to the door. Or, um, if, if you want to keep witches away, you can bury a, a knife under the door. You know, these are things that pretty much everybody had access to. It's not... It's not something that you have to be some big bad level 20 sorcerer or whatever to do. And... For gaming purposes, that basically makes it too easy. So they latched on to the poetic term cold iron, which had been used in that context, and they just made that into its own material. I didn't make this video entirely to talk about Dungeons and Dragons and how this is all kind of a misunderstanding. I've only been talking for like five minutes now, so I might as well talk about like all these these ideas about what cold iron could be if it was a distinct substance. So obviously in Dungeons and Dragons, which is basically the first time somebody did this, well, most of you are probably familiar with it if you're... Eh, yeah, most of you are probably familiar with this. But anyway, they have it as like a special kind of native iron, I guess, that is found deep within the earth, and it has some kind of a special magical property to it that is what makes it effective against fairies and demons and whatever else. And the reason that all iron isn't like this, I guess, is because if heat is applied to it, then it destroys this special property, and it just reverts to ordinary iron. So other sources have kind of used a, 
a similar idea where cold iron refers to basically any kind of iron that is found in a metallic state and it isn't heated to uh, shape it, which I guess in a game it can work, but in real life it kind of doesn't. You basically, um, you can find native metallic iron in the form of meteorites, but then you have all of the problems with meteorites, and, and that is another video that I should make. They they aren't really that pure. Like, there's there's this silly idea that because because they're special, I guess, because, because they come from space, and, and space is pure, then meteorites must be pure. But if space is pure, then where did the meteorites come from? Like, there's all kinds of crud out there, and most meteorites aren't even metallic. They're usually, uh, they usually contain a lot of olivine and stuff. And so I think around 5% of meteorites are mostly metallic. Well, the majority will have metallic grains in them. Then there's what's called telluric iron, which is native iron that does not come from meteorites, essentially. And this can be found in reducing environments, like where magma has intruded onto a coal seam or something like that, you might find native iron. And this is almost exclusively found in the form of tiny little grains that you, you couldn't really use for anything. Well, the, the only exception to that rule that I know of is Disco Island, or... Wow, I haven't said that out loud before and realized that it sounds just like Disco. But, um... Disco Island, uh, on the, like, off the west coast of Greenland, there are, like, huge boulders made out of iron, but the thing is, there's a carbon content around 3%, I think, in the large boulders of iron, which makes them essentially cast iron, except that it hasn't been cast, it just formed that way in the earth. Well, I guess you could say it's cast because of the magma. But you can't work with that at all because it would just crack. And then there are, again, small pieces that are too small to do much with that are pretty much made out of steel. And they all have a little bit of nickel in them. So I guess you could just kind of say that, you know, somebody got lucky enough to find a steel-like piece that was large enough to make something out of, which is already, like, I guess you can't really combine rarity, but I, I want to say, like, rarer than diamonds and gold combined. <laughs> like, native iron is, is rare enough in the first place. But then you run into the problem that you can't work any metal very much when it's cold. I mean, how much you can work them cold depends on which metal it is, but you're going to build up stress in the material as you work it, and eventually it'll just crack, which is why, at the very least, you're going to need annealing cycles. So, as I said a while ago, you can make it work in a video game by just hand-waving it, but it doesn't really make sense for the most part. There, like, another version of cold iron is, uh, somebody interpreted that as, like, like a mistranslation, or, well, I think this was actually fiction, not something that was supposed to have happened in real life, but supposedly it was a, a mistranslation of north iron, meaning magnets, and that gives you some issues when the earliest magnets were just magnetite lodestones, and by modern standards, those are really weak. Like, if that is enough to disrupt magical energies and, you know, offend the, the Fey or whatever, then what's going to happen when you have an iron bar magnet? Or, like, a steel bar magnet? Or El Nico? Or a neodymium iron boron? Just the, the idea of magnetic fields disrupting magic gets really weird if you understand how, to some extent, how magnets work and electricity and just everything. 
I don't really like that. I don't think I really like any of these. Oh wait, no, there's there's one that I do like, kind of. Basically, I'm going to make a video that explains more about this soon, but iron with a low carbon content can be produced from iron ore at lower temperatures than iron with a higher carbon content, and so you, you could kind of get the word cold from that, even though it's still, like, stupidly hot. That results in less rust, because, you know, carbon kind of increases the tendency for iron to rust, and so this low carbon iron, what, what most people call wrought iron, you, you don't really have to work it if you don't want to, <laughs> um... It doesn't rust as much, and I think rust was generally blamed on fairies, so this stuff that doesn't rust as much could be seen as maybe repelling the fairies. Another version that's kind of connected to that is the idea of phosphoric iron being the cold iron, and uh, this could tie into like Ar Aristotelian uh, alchemy with the, the four elements that have four properties, one of them being cold. What phosphorus basically does, it well, it does a few things. It makes iron harder, it also makes it more resistant to rust, again, and so that could work as, as a cold iron. And, um... Oh, real quick, uh, bog iron. Bog iron is not iron. Uh, people have said in the past that bog iron is like a, a form of native iron. It's not. It's mostly iron hydroxide, because bacteria can't produce free metal. That's just... I'm not aware of any living organism that does that. So I guess that basically concludes my awkward, drawn-out rambling about cold iron. <laughs>